you so much for that introduction. Yeah, this year I am doing like an Austrian tour of Jonas Linderoth. I Tomorrow I'm going to speak at the teacher college who are opening uh, a future learning lab. It will be very exciting. And then on Tuesday I'm actually hosting two workshops at the same venue. Uh, I started this tour on Thursday. We were having a one-day crash course in educational game design. I see some of you who were there here. Glad to see you back. I really enjoyed the event. Some of the participants, they made a, a game that teached you the probability of getting killed in different ways. And my main takeaway was for that was that the probability of dying of getting a coconut hit on your head is way higher than being eaten by a shark. However, I think personally, regarding the fact that I am here in Austria so often, uh, a game that were more situated to my conditions would be die of a cardiac arrest in the Rathaus stairs, maybe, or <laughs> choking on a Wiener schnitzel. Uh, Today I'm not going to talk so much about my research, I'm going to talk more about my teaching and the kind of teaching I've lately been involved in. I have actually for some years now been given night classes to teachers and other people who already have a profession about how they can design and use educational games. So it's going to be a little bit about sort of teaching a craft and the implications about that. What's interesting with this specific group of students, I think, is that since they already know a craft, many of them are already teachers, the games they make deviate quite a lot from the kind of games that you get when you have game, uh, game design students. Uh, these uh, students I have, they really, really try to solve hands-on concrete problems that they have seen in their everyday life, in their work, and they try to approach that by games. Now, one of the first insights one has to do when, when, when you sort of try to create a game design course for this kind of, uh, this kind of audience is that Educational games, of course, also can be analog. Like, like lately we have seen a huge increase in non-digital board games, and I think that, uh, uh, non-digital games, and I think that's very, very interesting, and I think there is a big area to explore there. So to just give you some ideas, what kind of games are, my, are, are this group of students doing? Here is the board game, the board game, and it has this title because the idea is that uh, you are playing in a board at some form of company, and the idea is to create a diverse board, a diverse board of people. When you start, you only have one kind of pawns in the board, and then you are to get a multitude of different pawns representing diversity. However, the system is rigged, it will negotiate itself back to this. The students were very inspired by Gramsci's theory of hegemony, so it's like the learning takeaway of this is, is that in order for this to happen, you need to do disrupt the system, so to speak. Here is another game, The Hard War, probably the only one that sort of was released semi-commercially. Uh, it's a two-player card game where you engage in a classical warfare in some fictional country and you play cards that are doing attacks on each other. However, on the back side of each card, there is a number of civilian casualties. And you can then, instead of playing an attack, you can expose, your, um, you can expose the other person how many sort of casualties their attack had. And if the game reaches a certain amount of civilian casualties exposed, then the game is over and everybody turns around their cards and the person has caused most civilian casualties lose. So this is a game where you deliberately or where you try to behave unethically to hide your horrible war crimes from the media. So it has a strong what we call procedural rhetoric in that sense. There are some students doing digital games. This is a math game. Uh, what's very interesting with this is that you go in a fantasy world and your 
Um, your uh, weapon to defeat monsters is a deck of cards you have. This deck of cards uh, you use in order to um, create calculations. However, what's interesting with it is that as you move along, you will get a better deck of cards that does more damage to the monsters. You will level the deck of cards. However, unlike many other games, the game also gets harder because a higher level deck of cards also gives you harder math problems to solve. And that's very different from what I, in my research, has called the illusion of learning. They're also extremely, as you can see, different games. To the right here, you see the dermatology game. That's, uh, that's uh, a student who was at the same time studied to become a physician, a doctor. Not a doctor like us researchers, you know, a real doctor, those who can, <laughs> those who can give you prescriptions. <laughs> uh, and, and he did this, and it's sort of the idea is that you should diagnose different dermatological, different skin diseases. It's really, really hard to play. It starts to itch everywhere on you. These cards are like really making it itch. Uh, to the left is a game for kindergarten children. Uh, and it's very much a game of, uh, of teaching kindergarten children to collaborate better. It's a, it's a game where you are to take care of, of passengers in a joint, in a shared taxi company. So these are the kind of games, and so there are, there are some challenges with doing this kind of teaching. Uh, there is one very general challenge, and this doesn't go for educational games in particular. This, is, this thing, I would probably say, is a general challenge when you teach uh, game design, and that is that uh, inexperienced game designers tend to create way too complicated games. They tend to start in cool sub-mechanics saying, oh, I want a card that can do this and this and that. And then you say, well, what's the winning condition of your game? Well, I have no idea. And in my courses, we call this the Yngve Malmsten syndrome, based on the guitarist Yngve Malmsten, who once was interviewed, and he, he, said, he said, people kept telling me, Yngwie, you need to slow down, you need to slow down. Less is more. And I just said, how can less be more? More is more. Uh, when it comes to game design, less is actually more. Otherwise, you might end up with something like this. All right, everybody, welcome to game night. Tonight we're going to be playing Risky Settlers, Knights and Allies of the Lords of Dominion of Earth, Pandemic Edition. Now, we've all played before, but Link, this is your first time, right? Yeah, but I mean, just get started. I'm, I'm sure I'll catch on. Well, everybody, start with picking a color and taking three cards. Oh, don't look at them yet. Now we roll the dice. Link, you rolled a two. That means you get to roll the mega die. You rolled a 14. That means you get three jumbo resource cards. Hey, don't look at them yet. Now we all grab items from the game chest that correspond to our item cards. I've got a crystal card. Okay, everybody provide two forms of identification, one for you in real life and one for your character in the game. I've just got my license. Well, I guess we'll be playing with a rodent entrapment expansion pack then. Now, swab your neighbor's mouth for a DNA sample. Now wait five to 10 business days for the results. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll stop there. You can Google this, it's, a, it's quite long. It's a wonderful little example of how some modern board games can be overcomplicated. And that is, like, that's so interesting because in my courses, actually the teachers tend to be the one who make the best games and the, uh, the sort of hobbyist gamers that are, have found their way to my course, they tend to make these Yngwie Malmsteen syndrome. Uh, a very specific problem when, when, when you do educational game design is what, uh, what you could call the ludification problem, and that is the problem that any representation you try to fit in uh, to a game tends to fall to the back. We rarely think of two Olympic fencers actually representing a quite horrific activity where you are to drive a sword through your opponent's body. This representation has fallen to the back. We see it as a sport. We see it as something that to be, we see it as a competition. Uh, and this is, of course, a problem when you try to create a game where you want to represent something. So in educational game design, we always have to help the player to make the representation actually come alive. But this also leads to something that's, that we have called the limits of play problem. This is a game called Sweatshop. It won a lot of 
It was acknowledged as one of the one of the sort of best serious games of its time. Won a lot of prizes. Uh, it represents, uh, it's sort of a satire which represents you managing a sweatshop in some third world country trying to create shoes and clothes that are exported uh, from a third world country. However, um, this game when they wanted it to be released on, uh, in the App Store, at, um, Apple said no, this is a very inappropriate subject for a game. Uh, so. We need to be very, very careful with what we try to represent, and it's, I think there is a sort of a lot of issue that has to do with what kind of graphics you use, and you need to have, um, you, need, you need to really sort of listen uh, so you're not tone deaf when you create educational games, otherwise you will end up with this kind of problem. Another thing that I think it's important to address is this. This is Richard Rao's sort of classical setup from his book, uh, Game Design Theory and Practice, where he says that a game design project can either start in the story fiction, you have an idea, you want to make a Lord of the Rings game, and you start from that. You have game player rules, say you have an interesting auction mechanic, you want to create a game out of that, then that's your starting point. Or you have a new technology, a new platform, you say, I want to make a hybrid game, I want to make a game for this new connect technology and so on and so forth, and then you start there. However, when we, when we think of educational game designs, educational games has a fourth dimension, mean, meaning the educational content, the things that we want to teach and learn. And this fourth dimension leads me to make the quite bold statement saying that educational game design is harder than ordinary game design. However, most often, uh, educational games are designed by the least experienced designers, and that is a problem. Uh, and that's what I'm sort of trying to address in my teaching. So these were some general problems, I think, related to this. And one way out of this, one way of, of thinking that I've, that I've sort of come to terms with is that a lot of educational game design has its own separate rules compared to ordinary leisure uh, game design for leisure purposes. Uh, so you need in some way to rethink what you have learned from ordinary game design. We need to break the fundamentals. And one of, the, one of these fundamentals is, of course, that the game has to be fun. Uh, I'm not so sure about that when it comes to educational games. This is a classical games with a message. Uh, it's uh, the cat and the coup. Uh, it's a... A uh, game that represents the former prime minister of uh, Iran, Mohammed Mossadegh, and his life. And you play as his cat, where you, by moving through the game, get to see the story of Mohammed Mossadegh in backwards order. It's beautiful, it's poetic. I'm not sure I would say that it has fun as an aesthetic, though. So, for me, educational games does not necessarily have to be fun. Another sort of, like, what we can say holy cow of game design is of course to reach uh, flow, to try and get the player to be in the flow channel and flow then being a state of mind where you really not care so much about, about anything else than being in that state. Actually, personally, I prefer Goffman's concept of engrossment. If you think this is interesting, you should definitely read up on that. That was a sidetrack. But the thing is that Flow doesn't really blend with uh, aesthetics that we might want for learning. For instance, reflection. We can in theory, like the nightmare of a commercial game designer is a game where the player stops playing, where the player puts down the control and stops playing. However, we can uh, think of a game that actually makes, an educational game that makes the player stop playing because they need to go and check some facts. For instance, go to the library and see something. Go out in nature and do something. Uh, reflect upon something you have around you. Talk with someone. And that would actually be an interesting educational design. When you design commercial games, you do, of course, want replayability. You want the games to be replayable as many times as possible because you want to give your audience money value for buying your product. However, in educational games, there are a lot of educational games that makes their point through one playthrough. So rep replayability isn't always a problem when we design educational games. It's all right to make a game that you play through uh, during one session, and then it has made its point, and you don't need 
to return to it again. And this is sort of a very, very different conditions. No one would sort of pay 50 euros for a game that you can play one hour and then you're done with it, unless it's extremely good. Which leads me to another concept related to game time. This is from the Swedish War Museum. Should you pass Stockholm or the Swedish Army Museum? They have an excellent exhibition on um, military game or g games for g war games and games for sort of training the military. This is a display of World in Flames, a game that takes four days to play. Anybody played it? Full set? You're not hardcore, are you? <laughs> uh, the, and, and the world in flame. Of course, sort of when, when you design for for educational practices, you need to have in time what are the what are the time conditions of the educational practice that I design for. If you design for schools, you do have these lesson brackets, and it might be a good idea to either create a game that could be played through one lesson, or that has some form of uh, structural. Uh, structural conditions so you can pause and take up gameplay in between lessons and so forth. So you need to handle time in a very specific way. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we end up in these really, really labored TED Talk-ish arguments where we say, oh, the problem with not getting educational games into school is that we need to change the school structure, the school needs to be blown up and rebuilt from the ground, and so on and so forth. And I, I think we should sort of instead adhere to the structure that schools have and try to design uh, for that. And that's sort of a takeaway from actually listening to the teachers, their problems, their conditions, and try to make their case in relation to game-based learning. Another thing is that good interface design can sometimes short circuit learning processes. It can omnit learning in a way. Uh, this is not an educational game, but uh, it is Reine Knizia's Kingdoms. Uh, it would be a really, really useful commercial off the shelf game to use in classes because you can learn. Uh, positive and negative numbers between one and six and multiplication up to four, so you could probably use it in, in up to 10, 10 to 12 year old children, somewhere like that. And in the board game version, you, you have to do calculations, you have to do math. However, there is a uh, digital version for tablets. In that version, when you draw a tile in order to, to move it to where you potentially want to place it. In, in the board game, you would have to calculate how much your end score would be for that. In the digital version, it calculates the score for you, so you immediately get to see where, where sort of the best way to place it. So uh, digitalization and good interface design makes the game, in this case, completely useless for learning. And this is something that if you have Come to Frog, listen to me, I've talked about how games can give you this illusion of learning. Part of that is the problem that many games use highlight techniques that really sort of makes the only perceptual interesting difference, the one between the things that glow really, are highlighted and glow really sharp and the stuff that doesn't. And that's very different to how perceptual learning happens in the real world where we need to differentiate between so many more dimensions. I would love if life was like a game though, so I could see if I have a problem then there would be like a big arrow pointing this is the way to the solution or sort of if I were to make a career choice now I'm trying to move to a new university. Who is the person I should talk to in the crowd if that person were highlighted would be awesome. Uh, another thing is that in ordinary game design, we need to design for zero-level heuristics. Heuristics here, in this case, meaning like the rule of thumb that a player has uh, when they approach a new game. Uh, like, you all have like, say, say uh, if you play blackjack, you might have an heuristic that I always take a new card if I have, uh, or I never take a new card if I have 12 or above on my first card, so something like that. So, because there, there is a risk involved. That's the rule of thumb you play with. It's not really a strategy, it's more like a, um, a thing that you need in order to, sort of, to approach the game uh, on your first level. And we want to create zero level heuristics in, in commercial games. We want like people who haven't really tried it to, to be able to enter it. However, when you design an educational game, sometimes 
you actually need to, to ignore that sort of fundamental because otherwise you wouldn't be able to make more complex game. For instance, an anesthesia simulator as well as the dermatology game I earlier talked about can't really be played if you haven't done some basic reading, if you haven't sort of, if you haven't sort of some preconceptions about the concepts that are in the game. So it's not really a game you can just sort of use when you, you immediately sit down there. And that's okay. You don't, need, you don't need to approach the zero level heuristics problem in educational game design. Uh, tremendously important is that when you design an educational game that you design uh, a learning opportunity instead of a test. Many of the challenges that we encounter in games are more tests about what you already knew when you came to the table. Uh, what you want to create is a game that has uh, a learning opportunity within it. Uh, in the dermatology game, I think that the student did a really, really interesting thing. He separated, uh, he separated the game into two periods, or two rounds, so to say. So in the first round, so the game is about you should sort of look at a card and you should tell uh, how would I reach a diagnose, what kind of sort of, uh, what kind of uh, necessary investigations do I need to do, what, what is the diagnose, how do I treat it, and what other diagnoses are there that could be a risk that I potentially misperceive, you know, like because that's the thing, if you're a physician, you need to know this looks like this, but it could be this as well, and I need to be aware of that. Now, in the first round of the game, you only need to have one thing right in order to score a point, uh, and everybody gets points. In the second round of the game, you take the same questions, the same cards, you shuffle them, and you place them on top again. So you go through the same card once more. However, now you only score a uh, a point if you have all four things correct. So what he did was that he created a really easy incentive structure that during the first round you must learn in order to in the second round have the correct answers. So unlike many sort of simple straightforward question games, he actually gave people an opportunity to learn before they were sort of assessed on what they knew. And then uh, and, and this is sort of, since I work with teachers, I work with, with people who have professions, we work with low technology, it's not really an issue of mon trying to create commercial products for monetizing on your games. Like what, what I see, if I, some of you know, you get to learn some students, you see them on social media, what they are doing, and it's always a pleasure to see that now I have created my own game, so it's very much like that, that I move on and take and create games in their own practice. So this is very, very different. We can sort of think of educational games without thinking of how to monetize them. And that's sort of, of course, not always possible in leisure games. I think we need to think a bit more as of educational games the way an artist thinks about making installation art, performance art. How do you monetize of performance art? Well, maybe you can't. Maybe we need to do it for other purposes. Okay, I will just round up by saying that uh, I have a new book project coming out. I have, if you haven't read something recently from it, because I've written in Swedish, this is a book, it's more about education. This is the Swedish school minister, you can't see it, she says what her favorite book is. It's Jane Austen and my book, I'm tremendously proud of that. However, I'm orienting myself back to trying to write a book about the issues I presented here. Uh, it's uh, on a very, very early level. This is the, this is the draft from Scrivener, and <laughs> this is what I have. But should you, however, find this uh, interesting, or should you have any ideas of what would you like in a, text, in a specific textbook for educational game design, I would love to hear from you. Uh, also being here, I have sort of playing with the idea of actually trying to get a hold of a German publisher and translate it into German and not only make an English edition. So if you have any ideas, approach me or contact me. This is my web address and this is my uh, Twitter account. Thank you for listening. <laughs>